if I was a seminary professor and I really didn't like one of my students, I would ask him to preach on the topic, on the text that we are looking at today. The text that we have today before us is extremely controversial. You'll see when you read it. So if I didn't like someone, I would say, okay, that's what's for Jeff or whoever. And uh, you go ahead and tackle that. The first time I read it, I thought, man, how can I skip it? <laughs> how can I talk about anything else but this particular topic? But then, I sunk my teeth into it. I searched for the real meaning of the text. And when I realized and understood the real meaning of the text, I realized this is important. This cannot be skipped. This is crucial. This is the reason why I preach through the books of the Bible. I don't preach four series or, or, or four messages, one series, topic after topic after topic. I know a lot of churches do those feel-good topics. You know, in February we're going to talk about love and marriage and you know, and, and, and month after month, and then they just pick the topics that they like and that people, you know, as they say, itching ears want to hear. But if I did that to you, as I told you a while back, that would be like feeding you a bag of chips. And when you eat a bag of chips, you're never really satisfied. You need something hard. You need a good meal. And the first message in this book that we're in, First Timothy, Sound teaching, the most important pillar of every church. So it holds everything up. Sound teaching. And that's what I have to give to you. The second instruction that Paul writes to Timothy in this letter, the first being sound discipline or sound uh, doctrine. And the second thing is what we talked about last week and that we pray together in public worship and it's powerful and it's edifying. It builds each other up. Last week we had a great service where we prayed for all people. We spent a lot of time engaging in prayer in the service. How many of you enjoyed that last week? Me too. Now we see this third instruction from Paul. It has to do with this title that I gave it, Know Your Role. To know your role. And what it is, is Paul is telling Timothy, instruct the church that you're at. He was in the church of Ephesus, in, the, in, the, in that city. The proper order of leadership in the church. You see, every local church, ultimately, has to be obedient to God. Because every church is God's church. When I invite everyone to join Live of Purpose, the title of the class that I teach is called Welcome to This Church with T, capital H, I, S, because it's his church. It's not my church, it's not anyone else's church, but his church. But underneath that leadership of God are elders. Elders are to lead God's church. And underneath the elders are God's people. So you could say then that God's people are called to submit to the elders, and the elders are called to submit to God. Now I fully understand, as soon as I say that word submit, or submission, immediately it's probably a negative thought that comes to mind, a negative connotation towards that word. But what I want you to hear today, what I want you to understand is that submission is not a bad thing. Submission done right, biblically, Biblically understanding submission, it's a good thing. It's a great thing. So I'm going to say this to you more uh, often than not here a lot today. Submission done right is never a fight. Submission done right is never a fight. Now before we get into the text in 1 Timothy 2, I'm going to tell you this is two parts. Part 2 is next week. So you see that Bible in front of you? If you don't have your Bible, there's a Bible in a chair in front of you. Put your right hand on that Bible and swear to me you'll be back next week. <laughs> Promise me you'll come back and hear the message. Because next week we talk about the roles of men and women in the church and in the family, in the marriage. Um, and ultimately we remember 2 Timothy 3 says all scripture is God-breathed and it's useful. 
in everything we do today. Every part of Scripture is useful. There's too many people that think the Bible, especially when they read a text like we're going to read today, they read it and they're like, oh, that's totally outdated, not even culturally relevant. I don't have to obey that. But all scripture is God breathed and it's useful today for us. And we just have to understand the meaning. So you can't treat God's word like a buffet. Well, I'll take that if I want it, but I don't like that, so I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to obey it. You can't do that. That's, that's not following Christ. That's not honoring God. So the text is tough, but we're going to stand in unity and we're going to read this this text today. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. Here's the text. Paul says to Timothy, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise, also the women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if she stay Continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. If there's a woman next to you, just grab under her arm and hold her tight. Just run for the exits. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word today. May it instruct us. May it teach us what is Paul really saying here. What are you saying to us today? What must we understand and grasp so that we can have a healthy church and healthy marriages and healthy government and so on? Father, let us understand the meaning here. Give us the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. You can be seated. So you might read that. Uh, how many of you have read that before and just were like, yeah, I don't get that. I don't know what the heck Paul was saying there. You know, what, what, the, what happened? Did he just get dumped? <laughs> I mean, what, what was going on there, right? Um, is he really saying all that stuff? Now, next week, we are going to tackle each one of those bits. Okay, and, we're, and I'm going to explain to you exactly what Paul meant by it. As one preacher titled this text, Adam's Rib or Women's Lid. <laughs> Is it about equality? Because, you know, culturally around the world we see that women are not treated, created equal. We know that. Or not treated equal. I mean, are created equal. Um, but 2,000 years ago, still the same, same thing. But in our country, we've had many fights, have we not, to have equality for all people? In this text, it's about equality. What this text is saying is that men and women are just different. They play different roles, specific roles. But when, when roles are filled correctly, when roles are done right, then there is no fight. There's no argument. There's no problems. So we have to interpret this text correctly. And that's the one thing I want you to understand about the Bible. The Bible has one interpretation. Albeit there might be many applications, but there's always one interpretation. All scripture. One meaning. For example, you know this to be true because when you write a letter to someone or you send someone a text or whatever, or an email, you mean one thing, right? Now, have they ever misinterpreted what you wrote to them or text them or emailed them? Of course, that's where the problems start, right? Because they misunderstood what you were trying to say to them. Well, we've been misunderstanding and misinterpreting God's word for years and years and years, which is why we have a lot of divisions and a lot of different denominations, right? Because we don't understand what God's word is saying. We have to understand there is one meaning here. There is one interpretation. There will be many applications, as we'll see today, but there's one meaning. Here's the meaning of this text. This is what Paul wants us to understand and all churches to understand. It's simply this. Elders, they are men called by God. They are called to lead God's church. And the church is sub to submit to their servant leadership. What's the very first thing I read? Verse, uh, verse 8. He says, I desire in every place, meaning in every church, 
when you gather together as a body of Christ, that it's the men who should pray, not like this holier than thou, I lift my hands and pray, right, kind of thing. But no, that they should lead, elders should lead the church, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. In other words, setting the example. And then in chapter 3, after we get through this whole thing about him talking about what's going on with the women, which we'll get into next week, what does he say in chapter 3? He lays out the qualifications for being an elder. This is what you are. If you're an elder, this is what, this is what it's all about. So the meaning of this text is that elders are to lead God's church. Elders are men called by God. Elders submit to God, lead God's people. God's people submit to elders. And submission done right, it's never a fight. When everybody's on the same page. Now the reason why this takes two messages is this. I didn't feel it would be good if I just read you that text and then talk to you for the next 20 minutes about why women should submit. Because to me, the scripture bears out when we read it all and take it all in as a whole. All of us are to submit. Paul would write to the Ephesians and say, we all submit to one another in reverence of Christ. So we're all in submission. And therefore, we need to understand what does it mean to submit? What does that mean? You've heard that before. You've probably read that, that women are to submit to their husbands in a marriage. And so there's a lot of, I think I really want to tackle that next week and get into depth. What does that exactly mean that the husband is the spiritual leader in the household? But the English word for submit is actually a Latin root, and it means to reduce down or yield. Like to bow down. Don't you picture like this, this dictator of a boss barking orders at his inferior employees? You've probably experienced that before. Right? They want you to submit to them. Which is why the majority of people in America don't like that word. I mean, I sat down with a couple once doing marriage counseling and went through that verse of husbands should submit to their wives and she looked at me like I had five heads. <laughs> and she was going to knock them all off. <laughs> she did not like it and openly admitted it. But she didn't understand it. She didn't get it. She didn't know what it really meant. Now, the Greek word for submit is hypotasso, and what it means is you put under or you arrange the order. You arrange yourself under. You picture an officer in the army. He gets the orders, right, from the superior officer saying, this is what we're going to do to win the war. You need to get your troop in order, and then all the men fall in order behind men and women, whoever's in the army, and they get in order, and they understand their orders, and everyone does what they're supposed to do so they can win the war. That's submission. That's biblical submission. To submit God's way is to really put down your pride and put yourself in order underneath the authority that God has put above you. When leaders lead the right way and the rest submit the right way, it's win-win. That's why submission done right is never a fight. Are you with me on this? Say amen. Yeah. Okay. Now, Jesus is our prime example for leading and submitting. That's what's wonderful about his life. He, show, he showed us so much. You know, we say that, that, uh, that you might know the verse, you know, he, he came so that we can have abundant life. And immediately people think, oh, eternity. We're going to go to heaven someday. That's why Jesus came. Yeah, that's why we celebrated communion. We're going to heaven because he died for us on the cross. But he also taught us how to live now the abundant life. He taught us how to lead. He taught us how to submit. He taught us everything. We just have to look at the scripture and see how Jesus acted. In fact, um, how did he lead? Paul says it beautifully in Philippians 2. If you're in any um, bit of leadership at all, at home or at the workplace or anywhere in the community, if you ever lead, you got to read Philippians 2 once a week. And just see how did Jesus lead. This is what he says in Philippians 2, Paul writes in verse 5. Have this mindset among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God something to be grasped. But what did Jesus do? He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, 
born in the likeness of men in a manger, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, which was an embarrassing death. Not only a painful death, but an embarrassing death. This is how Jesus led, with the utmost humility. It's what we call servant leadership. Right? We serve when we lead. We don't lord over people. We serve them. To me, that's the ultimate picture of, of a pastor. Serving his people. Elders are pastors serving God's people, not thinking they are above others. They are not. Don't give me a, a parking spot out here that says my name on it. All right? Because I'll put your name on it. I don't want special treatment. I want to serve because that's what elders are called to do. And that's what Jesus did, to put others first. And then the Gospels show how Jesus submitted. He submitted to his Father in all things. And, and there was a time in, in John chapter 4 when they were pressing him to eat. Oh, you haven't eaten all day, Jesus. You've got to eat something. He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. That's my job. That's why I'm here. I'm not here to fill up my belly every day. I'm here to serve God, my Father. Then when he was accused of, of healing people on the Sabbath, Jesus said, I don't do this on my own. I do what the Father tells me to do. I do His will. And in the ultimate test, facing His death in the Garden of Gethsemane, He's praying so hard, His capillaries burst, He's sweating blood. And He prays, God, take this cup. It's so painful. But not my will. Yours be done. That's Jesus. Submitting Himself to God's plan. And by the way, God's plan is for your benefit that we would have salvation. So Jesus teaches us how to lead. He teaches us how to submit. And submission done right, that's never a fight. You're going to argue with Jesus? Well, you didn't do it right, Jesus. <clears throat> You're not leading right? Come on. Submission done right is never a fight. I've been a head coach many times in basketball, and I've been an assistant coach. So I understand what it's like to lead a team. But also understand what it's like to be an assistant, to submit to the head coach. I get that. I understand that. And one of the greatest experiences I've ever had in, in being an assistant coach, submitting to someone else's leadership, is a man who is still coaching in Gross Point North. Gary Bennett is a great friend of mine. He's a Hall of Famer. And he's been coaching for a long, long time. And I love that man because he does things the right way. He's a man of God, and he just, he just is a great example. So to me, submitting to his leadership, that was a piece of cake. That was awesome. I loved every bit of that. But then there's been times where I've worked for bosses <laughs> that, uh, you know, they didn't do things at all like I would have done. They made decisions. They acted certain ways. But you know what? I didn't talk to them in their back. I didn't do things to undermine their authority. Because I believe God put them there for a reason. And that I was called to submit to God, so therefore I was called to submit to them. Even if it was awful leadership. I did it. And I prayed for them. That they would seek God's way and God's decisions. So that was um, always a challenge. If you've ever been there, and I'll be honest with you, when they were fired, I was a bit relieved. But, <laughs> but I didn't pray they were fired. <laughs> I prayed for God's will. And that's hard. It's hard to do when there's not a great leader in a position to submit to them. So what do you do, kind of answer this, this question, what do you do then when your boss or the leader in charge of you instructs you to do something that you know God would not approve of. Well, that's a bit of a dilemma, right? Because you have this earthly authority that's telling you to do something, and you know God is telling you, that's not right. So what do you do then? Do you still submit? Right? That's a good question. In the Acts chapter 5, the apostles were faced with this dilemma. The, the Jewish leaders told them, 
Stop preaching about Jesus. Stop spreading this news that Jesus is the Messiah and that he is alive. And what was their response? If you know the text, you know. They said, we must obey God rather than men. So they had to go to the higher authority. They had to go over the heads of these earthly leaders and go to the higher authority with the understanding that they would probably be killed, martyred, for that choice. So that's a choice and a decision that I think every situation would call you to be heavily invested in prayer before you make it, right? You, can, um, you should submit to your leaders, but you shouldn't submit to them blindly. You should trust that God is in charge. He's the highest authority. And if you're going to play the God card, <laughs> you got to know that there's going to be consequences. Right? As a public school teacher, I told the line that separates church and state all the time. I'm aware of the rules. I understand that. I understand that I am not allowed to proselytize. I'm not trying to, I can't convert my students or try to convert them into Christianity. That would be breaking the law. I understand that. Now some, they don't care. They'll cross that line and, and, and do that. It's a few people that do that. But I don't do that. I don't think I have to. I came to the conclusion a long time ago, it's God who, who changes hearts and minds. He's the one who, who converts. I just have to be a witness. Isn't that what Jesus said? He'll be my witness. In Jerusalem, Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So I'm not quiet about my faith. My students know. They don't understand the question on the math test. And Jesus is always a good answer. Okay? I give style points there. Four points for that. But we have to be smart about the decisions we make. I wish teachers would be more open about their faith. Some believe you can't say anything. Well, come on. That's who you are. You need to be open a little bit about sharing who, who you are. Now that you understand godly submission, let's see how it applies in specific areas of your life, like the church. I've already said this, that God is the head of the church. Elders are called to lead and submit to God and each other, and God's people are called to submit to the elders. Pass off that baby. <laughs> So we are called to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now here's the thing. The elders in this church, which right now at this point is, is me and Joe is, is um, moving towards being an elder um, uh, in this church. And uh, we I hope to add um, more elders um, in this church because I believe God is called a plurality of elders. I'm not a believer that there should just be one senior pastor in charge. By the way, don't call me that either there yet. Alright? I don't want to be there yet. So, uh, I'm not the one in charge. I think that there should be a plurality of elders in charge. I believe that's what Scripture teaches us. What well, we've done to mess that up over and over again in churches today. So, here's the thing. Will the elders make great decisions that you love every time? And you know that's not true. No, we won't. But will you honor the decisions that we make when they are backed up by prayer, right, and Bible study? Will you honor? That's the question that you have to answer. Because you either will honor them and submit and keep the unity in the church, or you'll walk away and you'll leave. And usually, the reason why people do that is because they are pride. And pride is a sin. And that's what happens. I've seen it in two cases in this church. Two men have left this church because of their pride. And they could not submit. I can't force them to stay. I can't force them to put their pride down. But it happens. It has happened. But I don't focus on that. I focus on all of you who are working to protect the unity. God's church. So submission done right, it's not a fight. In the church. And then there's the government. 
the government leaders. We prayed for all of our leaders last week. We talked about that, how we pray for all of our leaders. And God is the head of every government. Of course, somebody should let Trump know that, right? <laughs> We're under the authority of our leaders. Peter says it in this, in 1 Peter 2, 13, 14, and 15. You look at your screen. It says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. We're called to submit to God and to our government leaders, to our police and all, and all, and all of those in charge. And I don't know if you know this or not, but you will in a second. You've been pledging your allegiance to the government since you were a kid in school. Every time you stood up, Looked at the flag, put your hand in your heart. You said, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, all right? To the republic for which it stands, one nation. What are those two words? <laughs> Under God. See that? Under God. You've been pledging your allegiance to the flag. Under God. Now, what's really interesting about the pledge, it was originally written in 1892 by Francis Bellamy to honor Columbus Day, 400 years after he arrived. And it was a movement in the schoolhouses to pledge allegiance to the flag. But what, what's really, to pledge allegiance to, to America, but what's interesting is that um, they did not have the words under God originally in the pledge. They were added in the 50s by Congress and President Eisenhower during the communism times. It was a sign to show that America recognized that we are here because of God and that God is our supreme authority. How many times have you said, geez, I really wish our country would get back to understanding that, that our leaders would get that, that we are here because of God and we are under his authority. Well, thankfully, Eisenhower and the Congress chose to put the words under God into the pledge, which we've been saying ever since then. And what's neat, I think, today is that atheists and humanist groups have taken school districts to court time and time again to try to remove those two words. And every court, including the Supreme Court, has said, uh-uh, not going to do it. Not taking those words out. So if government that is truly under God, well, that would be a wonderful government to submit to, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And we have to pray for that, that our government would return to that, that would, that would strive for that. And of course, a lot of that has to do with the Christian leaders that are in place. That we would vote, right? To put Christian leaders in place. That would be something that we would want to do. And think about doing. Submission done right, it's never a fight. Then there's our family. God is the head of every marriage. When he joins together, two people, let no man separate them. The husband this is the part that, that we'll talk about next week and get into deeper. But the husband is the authority, is under the authority of God, where the woman is under the authority of the husband, and children under the authority of the parents. We're going to take all those verses that we talked about in 1 Timothy next week. Why did God, or why did Paul write to silence the women, tell them what to wear, all of that stuff? We're going we're gonna to tackle that. What he was really saying is that you're not to usurp authority. The authority that, that God has designed. That God has chosen the man that made the woman, and so on. And that he has a plan for all of this. The why part is not hard. Right? It's hard because we don't we don't always agree in our minds with God's ways, but His ways are not our ways. His ways are better. They're the best. He is good. And there's no if, ands, buts about that. God has a plan for this church, His church, and He has ordained it so. The meaning of this text is that elders would lead His church. I'll leave you with this because to me, it's the guiding light as an elder, as anyone who leads God's church. 1 Peter chapter 5. I read this often. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. 
Peter, calling himself an elder. He was an apostle, but he called himself an elder because an elder is an overseer of the church. That's what the word elder means, overseer of the church. And he's the witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as the partaker in the glory that's going to be revealed. He says to the elder, shepherd, that's the word for pastor, poimen, pastor the flock of God that's among you, exercising the oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge. That's that word that most people think of when they think of submit, that somebody's going to dominate you. No. You're an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, as Jesus, appears, you'll receive the unfading crown of glory. And those who are younger should be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. But God, because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. As I pray, and John comes up to, to pray for our offering, um, let's just be thinking about what it means to be humble, Hopefully, you've grasped the correct understanding of submitting. Let's pray. God, may we all submit to you, first and foremost. May we understand that you are the highest authority, that you are the one true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who loves us, and sent his son, Jesus. You sent Jesus for us. He taught us how to live the abundant life. He submitted to you each and every day. He led by example. He served. He died for us. Father God, as we raise up elders in this church, may we submit to you always. May we honor you and give you our very best. May we serve, not dominate over anyone, but may we serve your people. And may we all submit to one another in reverence for Jesus Christ. For he is our example. It's in his name we pray. Amen.